I'm Bree Luck, and you are listening to the Pause to Go podcast, where we explore the process of turning life's transitions into stellar transformations. You can expect interviews with experts, straight talk with remarkable humans, and conversations about making the most of every phase of life. Because when we approach life's stickiest spots with curiosity, support, and a little bit of inspiration, anything is possible. So whether you're on your way to work or settling in with your favorite beverage, together we can pause to go. As a solopreneur, I really like the flexibility to work from pretty much anywhere, so I'm happy to head down to Codebase Coworking, where I can enjoy the company of others while I tackle my to-do list. Also, they have a state-of-the-art, consumer-friendly podcasting studio that is, frankly, my home away from home. So head over to Codebase Coworking, check it out, and when you do, tell them that Bree sent you. Welcome back to the Pause to Go podcast, where we are speaking with creative changemakers who guide the way to living and sharing authenticity and joy in and beyond their professional lives. So last week, I spoke with my friend Erica Arvald, casting director, director, producer, educator, and CEO of Arvald Productions, and we talked about how she built her career her whole life, really. And if you haven't listened to that episode, stop now, go and give it a listen because she dropped some incredible wisdom about cultivating a career as a creative entrepreneur. In today's episode, we go through each of the seven paths to manifesting change in our lives. This is a sort of game I've been playing with guests in season two of Pause to Go. And there's so much richness in what Erica offers about how we can use the emotional, analytical, intuitive, physical, creative, spiritual, and social paths to enrich our lives and the world around us because we don't operate in a vacuum, thank goodness. But before we dive into this week's conversation, I just want to let you know that on Thursday, March 24th, I'm offering a free core values workshop at 1 p.m. Eastern time. It's on Zoom. You can register at my website, thelovelyunbecoming.com. And there's a link in the show notes and on Instagram if you like to follow along there. This workshop is something that I do individually with each of my coaching clients, and I take myself through the process at least once a year, sometimes twice a year, depending on the year. The core values assessment is a really great way to sort of scrub off the societal expectations of what we should want and get right down to the core of what we value so we can aim our professional and personal trajectory in that direction. Let's move away from the should, okay, friends? Yeah, Erica talks about the word should and what she thinks of it in today's chat, so let's get to it. Here's part two of my conversation with Erica Arvald. Can we take a few moments now to do a quasi rapid fire? Oh, yeah, love rapid fire. You have to cut me off because I'll <laughs> keep, I'll rapid fire too long. Rapid fire look at the seven ways to really creating change in our lives because you have done that. And I would just love to go through each of the seven ways and just have you spitball how that way has been articulated or important in your journey. And that can be professional. We now know that for you, professional is personal, right? So yes. we, we'll just say your journey, your whole journey. <laughs> My whole kitten caboodle. That's right. Okay. I'm ready. Okay. So the first one is emotional, the emotional way. Oh, yeah. I had, I had to learn to recognize that I went through a lot of pendulum swing emotions and that they were amazing feedback for me, not for others. Interesting. Can you tell me a little bit more? Yeah. I mean, I don't think I'm necessarily an overreactor. My husband would disagree, but not in business. I'm not an overreactor. In personal life, I absolutely will, because that's probably where I, you know, let all the air out. But 
even just to where my brain goes and I'm like, okay, hold on. That is not what was meant. I'm taking it in a certain way. I'm not understanding the context, et cetera. And I think it's taken me decades to really, you know, I, I remember me in my twenties in casting and thinking, you know, d- dividing the personal from someone saying no to a role from of course, or, or whatnot. And, and I think maybe that's just hours and hours and hours of collaborating with many different types of people with many different shades of ego, et cetera. And a lot of incredibly artistic, specific, nuanced opinions and ways of working. Now it's about the work. It's just about the work. And so that pendulum swing is a much narrower swing than it used to be. The next one is analytical. Oh yeah. I can get in that mode. And then I'm like, but analytical, isn't it? The, isn't that somewhat the opposite? I don't think it's the opposite of, but in the Myers-Briggs test, it seems to be opposite of intuitive, right? But I in think Myers it's Briggs. kind of the same in Myers-Briggs. In Myers-Briggs, I disagree with that. <laughs> Just saying, because I think there's a way to be intuitively analytical. <laughs> That's what I would say. I agree. I agree. I think that they overlap, right? All of these ways, as we go through them, I see as being very separate in that you can identify them and look at a trajectory, but they also are woven together, right? So it's like Mm -hmm. a tapestry that you could unravel and see exactly where this thread goes, but they weave together to help us create the full tapestry. We're just all about Joanne's fabric today. Oh, that's the theme. I mean, I think they should be a sponsor of your podcast. I think you should reach out to them. That's great. So interesting, though, Um, because the next one is intuitive. That's the next path. uh, Interesting. Well, I think, so I'm going to combine them if you don't mind. So the analytical to me is, is it's about data. It's about how one looks at data and discerns different things. And I have in business very specifically in a way that I was budgeting and job costing, being incredibly precise and analytical. And two years later, I had a financial advisor come in and say, you know, your data is already biased because you already divided it for a percentage for different factions of your company. So you're just analyzing the data that you already put in that was biased. And I'm like, oh, I, like it, I was like, Oh, it's not. So like, that's where it's like even research papers and stuff and academic, I can never say this word, academician. How do you say it? Academician. Well, <laughs> whatever it is, someone in academia, whatever they call them. Academic. Yeah. I will say <laughs> academics, you know, like there's so much research that do- is done. Right. But so many people in the world, not even just academics, but in the world do research looking for the data that supports their theory. Mm-hmm. So that's how I feel about analyzing a little bit is like, it's got to have absolutely, and you can't have all the data. You can't. That Science doesn't have all the data. Da- science is discovering the data and constantly changing. That's good science. We know that from the pandemic and the vaccines it is good science when the rules change. That means we're doing our job. And, and so, so that's why I think analytical is not the answer. Not that you ever even mentioned that, but like, I think it's not the whole picture. And that's why intuition and gut instinct and knowing your values comes into using that, that, those, that data. I think you're right on there. I really do. And, and I think it's something that we, when we get, I mean, looking at bias at the natural bias Mm -hmm. that happens, even having an awareness of that bias is part of the good science. Right. It's it's and it's part of good decision making. And and I think that the problem is when we can't recognize that our objectivity is somewhat impossible. Right. So we have to do the best we can and also take a broader look at at our perspectives and our limits, too. Well, exactly. It's like budgeting anything. Right. Like you're budgeting a movie. You want a 10 percent contingency. Well, now you want at least a 20% because 10% actually goes to all the COVID protocol. So it's like the, all those contingencies, it just means it's a padded. And I feel like in, in that discernment that you're talking about, it's like, what is that contingency for potential bias? Maybe you don't know what it is, but just the awareness that that can exist is helpful. And I think it's balanced out by the joy. If there is an idea or a class or 
I don't know, some other grand thing that I've come up with in my brain to say next year, I want to X, right, in in whatever, create this, then I have to go, well, the unknowns are this much. I'm probably th- not thinking of half the things I should be thinking of, which I think is the worst word in the English language. The worst cuss word is should in my brain. But then, you know what? My heart and my joy is like, screw it. It's all a grand experiment anyway. And that's what I say in all my classes, especially when I'm directing. I'm like, you guys, this is a grand experiment. We might just fail. And if we fail, it's my fault. You can blame me a hundred percent. And if we win, it's all your credit. All I'm there to do is set up the whole tone that it's an experiment. That's how I run the company. I mean, that's great leadership, right? That's great. Yeah, I'm not the first one that said that. There are all sorts of amazing leaders who like talk about that concept. I think I did it intuitively just because it's way easier for me to take the heat than it is for me to take the, the accolades, honestly. So I'm like doing it out of whatever, whatever psychological reason I have to do that. that that's my comfort zone. But definitely I have read that for sure. But reading it and knowing it is different from doing it. So kudos to you for doing oh, that. Thank you. The next one is create. Yeah, maybe you should ask ask the people at my company see if they really agree. <laughs> we'll we'll do a little a little poll. <laughs> yeah, do I think that's good. <laughs> um, creative. Oh, I think everyone's creative. I think, you know, I, I, I don't think you can be human without being creative. I think it's a muscle. And sometimes people don't use it a lot. And sometimes people use it so, so, so much. But creativity is is a part of the work. I mean, it literally is, is why we exist today. You know, the creative is so many, it doesn't mean necessarily art, creative thinking, creative solutions, creative doodling. So closely related to the experimentation, right? Giving yeah. room for something to arise. It's all about making space, holding space and yes. making space physical. Oh yeah. That's a new, I mean, I was, an athlete my whole growing up. I was a swimmer, um, like swam twice a day, morning and night, like pretty intense. And so I've always, always thought that keeping a healthy body means that keeping a healthy mind, et cetera. But I've had a very hard time in my life. I'm very good at meditating and I'm very good at physical stuff. And, and I don't even know how competitive I am. I started rowing when I was 40 with the group here, the Riviana Rowing Club. And I haven't done it since, which I really want to do. I did it for two years. But we're like rowing, having a beautiful view at 5.45 in the morning of, of the water and the birds. And then the, the boat next to me, someone's like, should we race? And I'm like, no, it's so nice. And someone goes, go. And I'm like, I'm all in. <laughs> like, literally, it was like a switch flipped. I was like, Who, screw the beauty. We are winning. And I was like, wow, Erica, you are flipping competitive. And then of course I tell my family, they're like, of course you are. I'm like, I never, ever realized that. But in that, that, that kind of unavailable connection for me is the same with mind and body. So that my, my physical was never, I was never able to meditate and move. If I meditate, I am still as a stone. And if I'm moving, I am really into knowing, okay, is my left hamstring engaged? Like, I mean, it's like every part of my body I'm aware of. And so it's been an interesting journey, for lack of a better word, to figure out how to bring those things close together. But I don't think I'm that close still, even though two years of yoga, it's like, I really, but I'm into the yoga. I'm not like thinking about other things, but it's like my mind likes productivity. And, and sometimes I feel like, I don't know, it's hard to meditate and also be aware of your body at the same time. You know, when you say your mind likes productivity, it makes me think how recently I have a new friend and Mm -hmm. the new friend, and I'm doing a little favor for her. And she said, what can I do for you? And I said, no, you don't get it. Like, this is it. (laughs) This is, this is how I friend. We are, we do something. (laughs) That's what I need. I need you to let me do this thing because it's, well, it's a productive and creative thing, right? It is interesting how we find our way. And for not everyone is into productivity. Yeah, no. And I just, I found that when I realized that, that was like a big aha moment for me. Cause you know, when you're in your twenties, or at least when I was in my twenties, I thought everyone thought the same as I did. I thought everyone's priorities were the same as mine. I thought everything, like, I think that's just a normal 20 year old thinking, but, but no, it's interesting. And I also thought everyone was a leader. I also thought everyone had these very specific 
visions or envisions of how how things could be like it's it's just a really enlightening thing to know that the way your own mind works is actually worthy individualized and worthy i wish everyone on the whole planet knew that you know yeah well we'll get there a long time. we'll get there that's what these oh, podcasts yeah. oh, are yeah. for <laughs> everybody on the planet is going to hear you say that okay the next one is spiritual yeah that's that meditation that's that i mean it this sounds so cliche. It sounds so cliche, but I'll just say it. I am such a believer in that the universe has your back that I don't know how to operate other than that. And when I don't believe that, when there is the day or the weeks that I go through and I'm like, it just doesn't seem like it. It's just like, it's like digging a hole. And as soon as I just go back to that core belief, it's all going to be fine. It's a grand experiment and the universe has my back. And everyone in my life, too, like it doesn't just apply to me. It's like the universe has our backs. It's all fine again. And it all starts, you know, talk about law of attraction. It all starts attracting all the, I don't know. But I also think it's just perspective. Well, it is my, I mean, you you have a whole mindset education program, yeah. right? It is mindset. Yeah. Yeah. But you are particularly good at it. Like I see you from afar. Do you have... A trick that works for you. It won't work for everyone, but how do you how do you bring yourself back to that place when you get out of alignment there? I grieve and I'm incredibly self-compassionate. And I had to learn that through therapy. Like like I had to have people tell me, you deserve self-compassion. And I have bonkers, like 27 inner children that I tried to pay attention to every single one of them. And and, and it's okay to feel like crap and like you're losing and that you're worthless. It's okay to feel like that because it's going to change. I think there is this trend towards what really feels like toxic positivity, right? Mm -hmm. And so that your way to trust is through the complexity of emotions, including grieving, including compassion, including recognizing and moving through overwhelm is really gorgeous. And I think it's, it's actually very helpful for people to hear that the way through to faith is by embracing the shadow. Mm, that's beautifully put, Brie. And it's weird because when I'm in those places, those, those yucky places, we'll just call them those menacing, stupid places. And it's like, I'm not able to say, oh, this is just a menacing, stupid place because I am seeing it from the outside. I'm in it. And I think that's where grit comes from. I think that's where practice, honestly, comes from. That's the starting over, the practice of that, because you're going to go through. I think it's just a part of being human too, but it it's hard to see during those times that things will change. So to me, that self-compassion and that utter, almost unconscious belief that things will change and the universe has my back. Those are the keys. And I can't remember them other than they're in my body. I have a kid in college, right? You have a kid in college. And there is a, a part of parenting that I'm just learning, talk about beginner's mind, of how they, they fix their own stuff. And they have most of their life fixed their own stuff and gotten themselves out of whatever but it's it's a real tricky time with the pandemic and everything going on in the world right now to really you know what what is the appropriate amount to step back and what's not and so then that, that voice has to come back in that to me too like the universe has your back you're going to do just fine they're going to do just fine social so social is yeah. Not just friends or colleagues, but it's all relationships. Yeah. The thing I have to say about relationships, personal and business, is a thing that's really hard for me to do. So I will articulate it. What I've, and this is like what I've learned. What I've learned. What are we talking? What's the whole overall scope again? It's the seven oh, ways yeah. to manifesting change. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. To manifest change, change. So the, thank you. Not keeping score of giving and taking, making sure if you are keeping your own score that it's not always taking. So that's the antithesis to not keeping score. But I think it's really important not to keep score of the other, put it that way. Make sure, but make sure you're not giving too much either. You're not taking everything, but you're not giving too much. And then 
really ending on good terms quicker th- before things go sour. Mm-hmm. I think that's really, really important because expect having expectations in relationships is just a dead end street. It's so true. Expectations in in general are a dead end street and certainly in relationships. And what I what I also appreciate about that as I think about my own relationships is that they have seasons, right? Where you mm-hmm. where you may interact with someone or be closer to them in a season and then you move apart for a while and then you can come back in a new configuration, but not putting a relationship or a human into a box that that is immutable is so yeah. important and gives us more room for grace, just like you were speaking of. And I love the reminder to to try to titrate that before it becomes a crisis, to be mindful mm-hmm. of that and to titrate it before resentment sets in because resentment is calcifying. Absolutely. And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you just are unable to see that it is going south. And because hope, you know, rose colored glasses, there's all sorts of, you know, legitimate sayings. <laughs> and and then you just have to go, okay, I learned something great. Move on. But I think that, you know, on the other hand, relationships literally build something exponential. So having relationships, having the social aspect within, you know, integrated into creativity, that's why filmmaking is such a passion is because it takes an entire group of sometimes hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people to create one project. And I just think that is incredible. And people at the top of their game in their very specific focus of their art and they're contributing. That's why it's movie magic. To me, that's the movie magic. It's not because they're falsifying a fake background and you believe it. The magic is that all these creatives come together full of unbelievable talent and joy and craft and all commit to one specific creative idea and then create it. That's crazy. It's like building pyramids. The alchemy of creative collaboration, right? It's unparalleled. It is the it most is. extraordinary experience. Yeah. I, I wish it on everyone. Yeah. I mean, you hope you have a great product, but like they say you can make a bad, a bad film. It takes equal amount of creativity and passion than a good film, you know? So, yeah. I was in a screenwriting group some years ago with, with a small group of women and yeah. nothing ever happened with this thing. We never finished it. It didn't matter. The friendships that emerged from that, the relationships, the understanding of self that came yeah. from that was the lesson in it, right? That was the that was the true mm-hmm. product of it. I think that's amazing. And we're all social creatures. I mean, humans are a a community based animal. So I, I remember going in LA, we'd always have these book clubs and more than half the people didn't read the book. And it just became a great catalyst to, you know, a gathering of, of people who loved hanging out with each other. And yeah, sometimes I feel like films are like that actually. Yeah. I, I also have to say most of the time, you end up with a product that you're really proud of. I mean, that's what you really want, right? You want both. One million percent. And I do believe, I mean, there are some horror stories about really cool films that came out, but I think the vibe on the set, I think the energy that is put into a project does show up on the screen. And if it's a positive, productive, you know, I, I just think it's good. I mean, I just finished, I didn't just finish, it came out. I cast Dope Sick. I cast 229 roles on this limited series called Dope Sick. And there were a whole lot of reasons that I could have said, no, I'm not going to work on this project. But there was something about the team, about the people, about the 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 content, et cetera. And it was just one of the things I'm so proud of doing, and I'm so glad I didn't say no for some really silly, very obvious reasons that I was considering not doing it. But that just shows everyone is really focused on the worthiness of what they're doing. That shows on the screen. It's so true. We've gotten through all seven ways. Really? Yeah. 
So I have one more question yeah. for you beyond that. Okay. And that is, if you had one wish for people who are... My favorite question. <laughs> one wish for people who are really transforming their lives, who are in the throes of that kind of transformation, mm-hmm. what would it be? It's twofold. It's that the way you see the world, your voice is unique and important to the world, that it matters to the world. And if you happen to already know that or are just discovering that, it's the responsibility of knowing that your voice is unique to the world is coupled, in my mind, with you're also exactly where you should be, where you need to be. You don't have to be more successful or ahead or have done something else and you don't have to do less you shouldn't be have not done this or you shouldn't have not done that like there is just trusting that where you are on your existential journey as a creative human being because we're all creative human beings is perfect but that value you can give yourself just acknowledging that your voice is unique and it matters That's what I wish everyone knew, period. And I think when people are in that place of knowing that, that's when magic happens. I love that. Well, thank you for being a great example and mentor in living living by those, but in living by those standards, in living by those wishes that you have for other people. It shows, it shows in all that you do and it shows in who you are. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure. You're one of my favorite people. You know that. And it's Bri, mutual. I would say that right, right back to right back at you. <laughs> right back at you. All the things you just said. I'm just putting a little mirror up right here. You you mentioned the universe has your back and Gabby Bernstein, of course, wrote a book called The Universe Has Your Back and she has a new book mm-hmm. coming out or that's out maybe now. And so she's been doing the whole podcast junket. And oh. she somebody was complimenting her and she said you know, I'm just a mirror, and and what you see is is absolutely oh, a reflection of who you are. So thank you for that reminder, and I'm honored to to reflect with and by you. Here are my key takeaways from this conversation with Erica Arvald. Number one, we come into the world and into any situation with inherent bias. Full stop. And having an awareness of that bias, understanding that we have a limited perspective is absolutely crucial when we are making decisions, whether that's looking at the systems that we are creating in business or analyzing our spending patterns. Also, our perspectives can shift as we get more knowledge. And that is good. That is growth. Number two. Erica says that should may well be the worst cuss word in the English language. Where are you falling subject to the shoulds in your life? And where are the opportunities to shift your perspective around them? Number three, when you get out of alignment, it may be helpful to grieve, to acknowledge the full spectrum of emotions that arise when you're in a place of doubt or shame or frustration. The way through to faith is not toxic positivity. It's about embracing our shadows with compassion. And that takes practice. Number four, I love Erica's wish for all of us to know that the way you see the world and the voice that you bring to all you do is uniquely yours. So use it well and know that you are exactly where you need to be to do that. If you are interested in checking out the classes at Arvald Warner Studio, and I highly recommend it, visit Arvald online at arvald.com. Special thanks to our sponsors at Codebase Coworking, to Dylanistic for the beautiful pause to go artwork, and to WTJU and the Virginia Audio Collective for your support. Thank you so much for listening to the Pause to Go podcast. If you got something out of this episode, let us know. Share it with a friend, join our Facebook group, and subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts if you loved it. If not, no worries. We want you to tell it like it is, and we'd love to have your input. If you want to know more about what I'm up to, you can follow me on Instagram at thelovelyunbecoming or at my website, thelovelyunbecoming.com. 
Stay curious, y'all.